All right, hi everyone. How are you? Thank you for coming tonight. Welcome. Uh, today is the Home City Soft Story Sizing Retrofit Information Community. Thanks for showing up. We are streaming live and we're going to be recording it as well. And so um, everything on the screen on the top right will be picked up and recorded. And we're going to post that later on our website. Okay. My name is Tim Pitsouris. I am the Over City Building Officials. Um, Building Safety Division. And with us representing today, I have uh, Jose Menville. He's an associate current um, planning, uh, current planner with the planning department. And he, he will be assisting with Spanish translation. Si me llamo Jose Menville, si alguien necesita oír algo en español, estoy aquí. Para, para producir. Few of staff have uh, joined remotely. There's a uh, Mark uh, Musner, director of the planning and development department. Uh, Candace Tut, rent stabilization coordinator. Shannon Lewis, rent stabilization coordinator. Also with us, we have uh, James Warden from the building safety department over here. And, uh, and Lisa was uh, giving me help uh, assisting uh, with uh, the presentation. She's our uh, Culver City senior management analyst. And uh, the city consultant we have with us today is Dayton Pope. And we have uh, Daniel of the Better uh, representing Dayton Pope. Uh, to get a quick understanding of the audience, we just do a quick show of hands. And if you're in the chat, if you just want to show us if you're, um, you know, uh, if you're a building occupant, if you're a building occupant, you can raise your hand so we can get a show of the audience. So we got a couple of building occupants. Um, are there any, any contractors? So we have a couple contractors, a couple occupants, and any owners. We have some owners and um, some design professionals. Are we need design professionals. Okay, so we have a good range of um, owners, design uh, architect or um, contractors, and occupants here with us. Uh, a, bit of, a quick bit of housekeeping: turn off your cell phones. And mine's on. And um, if you're on WebEx, make keep it uh, keep it on mute. Um, the restroom is in person here through the double doors. There's also a validation machine in the hallway for your parking. If you on the way out, you can validate. Uh, we're going to hold the questions to the end of the presentation. We're going to open the same form. And if uh, you're virtual and at any point, you'll be able to add a question to the chat and then we'll reach out to you at the end of the presentation. Really, the purpose of this uh, meeting is to go over the soft story ordinance, which is to promote the public safety and welfare by improving the performance of these soft story buildings that we have in our building stock, with the purpose to reducing the risk of death and injury to the building occupant. Also, it helps to promote a uh, resilient community and reduce overall uh, the uh, destruction after an earthquake. Uh, the meet this thing in particular, we're going to go through the background of the Cobra City Software Program, the roadmap to compliance, retrofit methods and examples, the uh, overall view of, it, of the involved parties, uh, tenant protections during the seismic retrofit. And have a Q and A section following, um, so we can answer any general questions. With that being said, I'll turn it over to Daniel um, to start the uh, the presentation. Sounds good. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Spin. Again, I'm a consultant to the city. Uh, my team led a uh, substantial survey of the of the city, just so that we can try to understand the building stock in the city, as well as assisting the city with. Uh, developing their seismic ordinance. I, I have a lot of experience with this type of material as well as actually doing some seismic evaluations, retrofits, et cetera. Um, so today we're gonna give you a presentation that really focuses on what the ordinance is all about and most importantly, how the process is in order to achieve independence. Um, so with that, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> So this is uh, what the ordinance is, is targeting. It's, it's a mandatory seismic strengthening of existing wood, bu uh, wood buildings with soft weak or open fronts. Um, it's, I'm gonna explain what all that means in a, in a little bit, but it's basically talking about uh, primarily, we see these types of buildings on multi-tower buildings that are made of wood construction. 
Uh, and and I'll, I'll show you some photographs of what that looks like. It's targeting a building that we built prior to 1978. And notices are going to be sent out to uh, to owners. Um, and the first priority notices have already been mailed um, on the on the sixth of this month. So this is a cartoon of what it what a typical building looks like uh, that we are targeting on this ordinance. It's a multi-level uh, structure made of wood. And really what the problem with these types of buildings is when, when a seismic event uh, hits the building and shakes back and forth, and at the ground level, it doesn't have enough strength um, to sustain that movement. So what ends up happening is that uh, the bottom floor just gives out and then the top, the top, uh, the top floors just collapse on themselves. One of the ways that I like to kind of explain this is imagine that you're a football player and somebody's trying to tackle you, they tackle you at the knees. That's the easiest way to bring down that player. It's very similar in this fashion that, you know, the, the, those, those knees of the building are, are really giving out and, and the building just collapses. So we need to, we really need to address that area. Next slide. You can see examples that we uh, of actual buildings that, and how they have uh, reacted in seismic events. And in 1989 was a large um, seismic event that happened in Loma Prieta up in, in Northern California. And we saw these types of failures in, in multi-story buildings. Uh, there on the left side, you can see that building is actually leaning. I actually, I, I was not, I did not witness that, that particular earthquake, but I, I, I know some um, friends of mine that actually were there as engineers evaluating those types of buildings. A lot of those buildings, uh, the only reason that they actually didn't collapse is because the garage doors were actually open and, and that helped almost uh, hold that building in place. But a lot of them, unfortunately, did actually collapse. The one on the right side, which has happened um, you know, close to us, in 1994, we had the Northridge earthquake. In that, we, know we had um, a lot of damages and a lot of these buildings actually did collapse. You can see there where we lost the first ground floor, and then the mass actually uh, went down and, and, and injured, and, and actually uh, a lot of folks lost their lives to that type of collapse. Next slide. So the ordinance is targeting those, again, those types of buildings, but it does have some exception, exceptions. Um, we are not targeting um, buildings that, that are, you know, a single unit building, uh, an ADU building that, that is built on top of a garage, that's not part of the target, of the targeted building here. And then if, if there is an HOA with several buildings, then, then you, can, you can go through the process with the city just to make sure that there are no, that, that these types of buildings are or are not being targeted. And that, that, that will be done through a screening process that I'll talk about uh, in, in the next few minutes. The city has put together a, a, a small uh, handout. You can find that online um, where you could, it'll take you through all the steps of how you get compliance. The first step is gonna be screening and we're gonna do some retrofit plans uh, a permit is going to have to be taken out for those retrofit plans, and then eventually we're going to go through construction. So I'm going to go walk you through each of the steps and just so that we understand what it really means for, the, for, for that particular step. So the screening is, um, needs to be submitted within the first year uh, that the owner receives the, the notice. And that requires that the owner hire a, a structural or civil engineer that is going to assist them in filling out this form. Um, the, the purpose of the form is really to make sure that we got the right buildings um, being targeted. Uh, it also assists the city in verifying a lot of the administrative uh, information, make sure, making sure that we got the right address, that we got the right uh, parcel number, um, that we identify the right areas that need to be retrofitted. So it, it's serving multiple things, but the primary thing is obviously to ensure uh, that the building that's being targeted is the, is the right one. Next slide. 
Uh, the next step is for the uh, engineer that was hired to put together some retrofit plans. Those retrofit plans must be done within two years after the notice has been sent out. Um, again, the, they are re, uh, the owner is required to hire a professional, uh, which would be a, a licensed civil structure engineer, and those plans are going to be submitted to the city so that they can be reviewed. Uh, those plans are uh, essentially going to identify the scope of the work that needs to be done on that particular building. So it'll show you whether the building is going to require um, some walls, and some frames, a uh, combination of the two, um, etc. Okay, next slide. And then from that point, uh, once it's submitted to the city, then the city is going to have a year, uh, up to a year, uh, uh, so that they can, so that they can begin, uh, so that they can issue a permit. Now, basically, what that means is that the plans are submitted to the to the city. The city does their due diligence to make sure that it meets uh, the code and the ordinance standards. So the ordinance. Uh, in, in, within the ordinance, it has a lot of technical requirements that the engineer would have to follow and make sure, uh, so the city is just making sure and ensuring that those technical standards are being followed and that the, that the proposed retrofit is going to meet the minimum requirements that the ordinance is asking for. Uh, with, after the review is completed, then a permit is issued, which uh, basically is saying that the build, the, the those plans are ready to be constructed. The, the, the owner will have up to a year to begin construction uh, after that. Nice. And then we're gonna have an extra year once the construction has begun uh, so that the owner can actually complete the construction. So all these are accumulative. If you add from the time that the, the, that the actual owner receive the notice until the construction has been completed. Uh, that is a total of five years that the ordinance is currently allowing. Um, again, that is that means the uh, screening form, the, the, the actual design, uh, the, the review, the permitting, and then construction is a total of five years. After the order, after the bit, after the construction is complete, then the inspect the, the city will send out their inspection team to ensure that the, that the work has actually been completed in accordance to those permitted plans. And then the, the city, once, they, once, they, once everyone is satisfied, the city is satisfied that the work has been completed in compliance with the plans and with the ordinance, then they will issue a certificate of completion to make sure that the, the building is compliant and, and, and no one ever questions that. Now, oftentimes we hear, well, what kind of work uh, are we talking about? This is a cartoon that shows a typical building um, that has this, this um, deficiency in the front. And what, the, what often is provided, and this is not the only solutions, I'll show you some photographs of what, what uh, are, is typically done, is that that front that, that is actually um, uh, one of the weakest points in the building, is actually uh, is often strengthened with some kind of a frame, so that involves uh, some kind of steel elements, uh, uh, columns and beams, or a column and some heavy foundation. Uh, and the really the reason that we that we do that as engineers is we try to again strengthen that open front, that open face, and to make sure that it's at, at least as strong as the as the as the as the stories above it. Now, in the perpendicular direction, oftentimes uh, we do need to strengthen it, and that could be done with uh, either uh, sh uh, walls. We call those walls shear walls, or we call them, or, or, or you could also use frames. The combination of what needs to be done for your specific building is going to be decided by the engineer in collaboration with the owner. Uh, it's not just about the engineering and making sure that the building works from a strength perspective, but we also, you know, the other considerations that will happen is, you know, is there a way to get in your parking stalls that you previously had, 
Uh, are the cones, uh, you know, skinny enough? Do they don't interrupt the, the flow? Um, so those kinds of conversations are going to happen between the engineer and the owner, just to make sure that there's the least amount of impact as possible. So here are some photographs of actual retrofits that have happened uh, across Southern California. These were provided by one of our local engineers that has done some of this work. You can see here, this is a, what we call, we call that a moment tree, steel moment tree. Um, this one in particular is, is, is by a proprietary system, but it could also be done in a custom way where it's very customized to the specific building. And you can see here that it has uh, columns every so often, and then it has this, this beam that ties it together. Uh, and then um, you may, uh, you can see here on the, on the floor, that there are is a, it's a color shaped concrete. Uh, that's just an indication that there was some foundation work that was done. And often, what's done is that the work is coordinated with the tenants and with the owner, uh, so that it can be done in phases, so that uh, you don't interrupt the, the flow of the traffic in one uh, at once. Uh, they could also be done off hours, etc. That's that's those are the types of coordination that are going to happen between. The construction team, the engineering team, and the owner. Okay, next slide. Uh, <clears throat> these are uh, these. This is uh, the same type of retrofit, but this is more of a custom ret uh, custom frame, of what I call it. So again, this is this is a design specifically for this building, and, and it uses a different um, uh, design standard. And all these types of standards are are are, are uh, allowed. For, for these retrofits and are permitted by the ordinance. Next slide. This again is a photograph of what that particular uh, retrofit looks like. The difference between this retrofit and the first one that we saw, where you saw the overall frames, is that this particular retrofit, you can see that it's tucked underneath into the, into the space a little bit, right? That's done for different engineering reasons. But overall, you know, the, there, what the point of the slide is that to show you that there are a lot of flexibilities in terms of what can be done with a specific building, depending on, on, the, on, on what the implications of, of um, uh, parking are. So next slide. This particular building um, uh, offered itself to add a wall rather than a frame. Uh, there was already a wall there, but the wall was not meant to take on these forces that we are designing to. So what this engineer did was they, they removed the stucco from the wall, they exposed the studs, and then to that they added plywood. And that plywood really creates a lot of resistance to this movement that we're trying to avoid, uh, or uh, trying to resist, I should say. Uh, when they put the plywood on it, it gets nailed, and then it gets tied up into the up into that 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 uh, floor level right above it. It gets tied to the foundation, and then that, that creates that resistance. Now, I would say that in many cases, uh, you would have to extend the the stucco removal so that you can create a bit a longer time. And that is really dependent on the building and and the engineering forces that are being designed to. In some cases, the existing foundation is not large enough. So you would have to dig that out and, and enlarge your foundation. But overall, again, the, the photographs is trying to illustrate that it doesn't. Uh, uh, you can you can attack this problem in many different ways. Next slide. Here is a typical detail of what you would see again after the completion of the retrofit. This is what I try to highlight at the uh, at the in the original column. I mean, original. Sorry, the original slide. And the first slide with photos is that. You will, you will see an outline of, of where the foundation was dug up and, and increased to make sure that we grab onto these columns or perhaps the wall and make sure that we have enough resistance there. So this is the final outcome, okay? You can see here, this is a, a couple of the buildings that have already uh, uh, gotten through their seismic retrofits. Uh, the elements that were added, the, whether that be columns or walls, um, you know, there's there's um, furring that's uh, attached to those elements. There's stucco that's placed in there, and, and and in this particular instance, the owner really wanted to uh, make sure that those new elements 
um, or part of the building. Uh, but I would say that then in many cases, the owner just simply uh, leaves the, the elements exposed and makes sure that they're painted correctly so that they are not, uh, so that the, the, weather, the weather doesn't affect them. So it really is a choice of the owner as to how much enhancement they want to do with those new elements. For the, like, the choice of the owner to do what with the elements? Uh, just to enhance them from an architectural perspective. Just so the, there is a structural requirement, but then after the structural requirement is done, uh, if the owner wants to paint the element, if they want to add stucco to it just to make it look nicer, yeah. obviously that is a choice of the owner. That's not a requirement by the ordinance because that is all aesthetics. Yeah, so to be clear, it's that if if you're adding the column, right, then the column can doesn't have to be wrapped with stuff or fireproof. It could just be painted if there's an existing column already there. And then the, the other one is if you're taking away, removing and replacing the column, then you would have to wrap and fireproof the column in case of a fire. It really depends on is if the original if the original wall. I'm sorry, if, the if, if an element is being replaced, um, there are code requirements as to whether it needs to have um, what we call fireproofing or correct. So if we, are, if we are replacing an element or strengthening a particular element, then those code requirements will be, will be tricked. But if we are adding a new element, in this case, uh, in the previous photograph, a new element was added, not a replacement. So that was a that was a choice uh, based on aesthetics. It really depends on whether the element is a, is being strengthened or whether a new element is being added. And that those types of triggers uh, are going to be handled by the engine. Absolutely. Yeah, like, yeah I've done about like five hundred of these retrofits um, for LA. Um, I specifically came to this meeting because, um, and you're doing great, by the way. I want to know like specifically for Culver City, because I've only done five retrofits in Culver City. And I was like mainly wanting to know the difference, the big differences in Culver City to like Los Angeles and to the other new spotties. Okay, we can get to that at the end of the presentation so that we, that we finish that. Thank you. So um, let's talk the parties involved, so many of you probably haven't actually done uh, some of these retrofits, right? So uh, the parties that are involved in a seismic retrofit is engineers. Um, the engineer is in charge of doing an, a, a structural evaluation of the building and, and a structural design of the, of the actual uh, retrofit. Um, they are the numbers, the number people, right? They, they know how to how to, uh, how to determine those loads, you know, how to meet the criteria and the ordinance. So that's what they're, they do. And they also put together those drawings uh, that the city is going to evaluate. Then there is the city reviewer. The city reviewer means that when those drawings, again, are submitted to the city, then the city uh, has the obligation to just do a, a, an overview, a, a review of the drawings to make sure that the intent of the ordinance is being met by the retrofit. Uh, we have the contractor. The contractor is the person that's actually taking those documents um, and then installing, um, you know, getting all those all those hard materials going to the site and installing it to make sure that it meets the actual uh, drawings. And then we have the, ins uh, the inspectors. Uh, the inspection the inspection team works uh, uh, so so the city has um, uh, inspections um, they, they go out to the site and they, they want to make sure that, that they are they are meeting the intent the intent of the uh, of the plants and the intent of the plants. so those are all the parties that are involved in, a, in an actual design Oftentimes we get asked, well, well, what's the difference between a design bid build and a design built? You may be contacted if you're an owner uh, or, or a resident that is interested in the topic. You may be contacted by different parties um, and, and they, they may be offering you different services. Uh, there is uh, oftentimes they call it a turnkey uh, solution, which they are referring to a design build solution. And what that means is that it's one entity that in-house, they have their own engineers 
And, and what they do is they will do the engineering in-house. They will also do the, the permit. So they submit to the city. They're in charge of um, addressing those comments. They, they get, the, they get the, the actual permit and then they go out there, they build it, and they basically take care of the entire process. So a lot of owners really enjoy that because they, uh, that means that they don't have to worry about a lot of the coordination. Now, some owners, they wanna be a little bit more hands-on and they use what we uh, uh, call design big build. And what design big build means is that the owner uh, basically is a lot more involved. They hire an engineer and they hire the contractor independently. Uh, the engineer, they work directly with the engineer uh, to make sure that those plants are, are, are designed and permitted. And then when they have those, those plants on hand, then they go and they bid out, they bid out the work to multiple, to multiple contractors. They get different bids, they do a comparison, and then they do the pluses and minuses on both of them, and then they, they select a the contractor. Uh, we're not here to advertise that one or the other is better. It just has different, uh, different uh, pluses and minuses again, and it's really up to the owner to decide which option they want to, they want to use. Right, whether they want that turnkey or they want to be more involved and and, and feel that, that that's going to give them the, the, a bigger value. Next, I think there's one point to make on that. May I? Um, if you don't mind, so it's the end and then we're coming around again. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, another, another question that we often get is how you find an engineer. Um, if, if you are going to be uh, uh, addressing this problem, this problem, and, and again, in, in a design bid build where you are, where you want to go and and hire your own engineer, you're looking for engineers. You don't know where to start, especially if you're not used to doing this type of work. Um, they, they, there is an engineering association in Southern California. It's called we we refer to it as a SEALS, the Structural Engineering Association. Of Southern California, I know that's a mouthful. Um, if you if you get the if you get the slides, by the way, there are links in, in a lot of this um, and you can you can go find the information. And there is a nice uh, small you know quick read, a uh, couple of pages, which where it just basically tells you what is a structural engineer, what do they do, what are they responsible for, um, and then uh, CIOS, uh also has a, a page where you can just uh, type in. Um, that you are looking for a certain engineer that, that does certain type of work, and and then it'll give you it'll give you a list of engineers that they can do this type of work. Now, the city doesn't endorse what they say. This is just a reference that you can certainly go out there and. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Again, oftentimes what we also get asked is, how do you vet a contractor? Um, you know, you may be, you may, you may get um, uh, contacted by multiple entities that want to help you, and and you may get overwhelmed. Uh, there is, you know, when you go to uh, uh, when you go to this uh, uh, website, again, some some kind of rules of thumb and some good uh, recommendations as to how you can um, vet a contractor. Um, you know, uh, I think it's just pretty uh, simple. You know, good, good, good common sense and good practices. They get multiple bids. You know, they recommend that you, that you should get at least three. It's completely optional. Some owners want to get ten. Some owners want to say, "Hey, the, the first guy I, I interviewed, you know, really made me feel comfortable, and that's what I want to go with." It's completely up to you. These are just recommendations that are provided by them. Uh, you review the contractor's uh, records, you get references, um, you verify the license. Here's a link where you can verify the contractor's license or a phone number that you can call and make sure that they've done a good job. You can ask for references again. You know, uh, There are multiple things that you may want to do just in case they, uh, you want to get more familiar with the process. Um, typical retrofit costs, they, these can vary throughout, right? Um, uh, there, there have been studies that have been advertised by multiple cities. Um, you know, it really depends on the size of your building. It depends on how big your building is, how many, how many frames you, you, um, you're going to use, 
Uh, it sounds like there are multiple contractors in the room. You can talk to them, uh, reach out to others. Uh, uh, a number that we have seen is that they that they could cost you know forty thousand dollars for a frame, but how many frames do you need? It really depends on the person. So uh, again, it, it depends on a lot of things, and it really it's it's up to the owner to get that level of understanding uh, on their particular. Thanks. Yeah. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. So. We are going to talk now uh, about uh, a different uh, a different uh, topic. But Pip, do you want to take time to answer comments on the first one, or you want to move to the next? Yeah. Uh, at this point, we're going to move over to the tenant protection part of the presentation. And online right now, we have our two uh, housing uh, specialists with the uh, rent control. And if you'd like to um, start off. Uh, the, Presentation is yours. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon Lewis, and I am the Rent Stabilization Coordinator for the city's Housing and Human Services Department, specifically for the Rent Control and Tenant Protections Program. Um, also on the line is Candace Tut, who is our Rent Stabilization Analyst, um, also for the Housing and Human Services Department, again, specifically for the Rent Control and Tenant Protections Program. Um, as they've already mentioned today, we're here to discuss tenant protections during seismic retrofit. Next slide, please. So when seismic, seismic retrofit is occurring, um, the tenant protections ordinance requires that a tenant impact mitigation plan that we also call a TIMP is completed prior to starting any of the work. Um, it must be submitted and it is required to outline any impact that the work will have on any tenant occupied units and steps that will be taken to mitigate those impacts, including possible temporary relocation. All property owners who are completing seismic retrofit must complete a PIMP with us um, and submit it to the Housing and Human Services Department. Again, it'll be reviewed with the rent control and tenant protections program. And before the work can begin at the property, we will have to actually not only review it, but approve the temp. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a sample of what the temp looks like. Um, if you want a copy of that, we can uh, drop the link in the chat, but we can also, you can also reach out to our program to provide it. Um, but the TIMP includes us getting applicant information from you, property information, general contact information, and whatever work they'll be performing. Um, that'll have to be outlined in the TIMP as well, along with the impact of the work at the property. So if there's some type of like noise or like utility interruption, we'll wanna know if those impacts are, are occurring. Um, and then also, and most importantly, whether or not tenants will be required to be relocated as a result of the work that's being performed at the property. Um, the type of relocation or the, the necessity for them to be relocated will depend on the work that's being done, but it could be you have to relocate them to a hotel or a motel or a comparable unit if there's one available, or if you want to pay them a, pay a daily per DM. Um, and in some cases, if it's going on too long and they're required to be out of their unit, um, some type of buyout agreement. Next slide, please. A little bit. Yeah, can you uh, speak up a little bit? What's that? Yeah, can you speak up a little bit? Jen? Yes, sorry okay. about that. Is this better? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so you are required to provide your tenants with notice. The tenant protections ordinance requires a 30 day notice prior to any construction starting. And it has to be in an easily observable location. So um, that could be at or near the tenant entrances and it must be posted and remain posted throughout the construction. Um, the tenant notice also should outline the duration of the construction work as well as 
the nature of the work. And that's it for us. Yeah, we did see a we did see a comment that was asking how did we basically basically how did we perform the the surveys? So the surveys uh, the survey that we did, I guess it was primarily an electronic survey, which means that we used Google Earth as much as we could so that we can identify the the buildings that have the characteristics that are uh, that are typically that typically make make these buildings weak which is that tuck under parking, that open trunk. So that's typically how we did it. Um, where there was doubts, we did go out to, to, and, and drive to the specific location and, and walk in front of it. Um, but you know, there are situations where even the images or even the walk will not, because we cannot go inside the property, the private property. So we can only do our surveys from the right way. So in situations where there was doubts, we were conservative and put them on the list. The purpose of the initial screening form is to make sure that we get that final list uh, in place, right? So that we can make sure that if a building was in there for a conservative reason, because we weren't quite sure, that screening form will then, will then tell us the right answers. Because then by then, we actually get photographs, we actually get plans if they do exist, et cetera. Um, if a building was missed, uh, you know, oftentimes that gets kept we catch that in, in the entire program as as the as the city and the building officials uh, understand these where these buildings occur and they're doing inspections you know if if, if uh, a building may come up that, that wasn't originally on the list so does that answer the question yeah okay is there any uh questions for the audience I was following up on the screening form. Are photos good enough, or do you need actual locations and app to get it exempt? Screening report. Um, the screening report does have sections for photos, and during here we'll be able to say whether or not any of the specific conditions that is strictly directed are present, or if the building is compliant with the ordinance or the planning and what will be done. But plan required for the screening. And if it's clearly that they don't have under parking, we would have to even go in there and, and drop the building. Yeah. Uh, it looks like essentially this starts on the 24th, year 24. So as an owner, Diane and my wife is, uh, it looks like we have to be finished by 29, right? It really depends on when you receive the. Yeah, so in other words, we could still possibly be doing construction, say, late in 28, and we would possibly go over in 29 and we wouldn't be uh, penalized. Is that what you're saying? Your your timeline begins when the owner receives the notice. So, right. the, so for example, the reason that's important is, for example, if priority one, if the letters were already sent on the, on the 6th, Mm -hmm. Right on ten on, on October sixth okay. of this year, then yeah, I got you. you then, and then you five years from that from that then, actual from date, the actual date of the letter, yes, that actual date, date. That notice at that particular date, yes, and and that and, and they they are they are separated by priorities so, uh, for different reasons, just to make sure that the city doesn't get overwhelmed, the resources out in the area are not overwhelmed. Right. So that's that's why they're spread out and they're spread out for very reasons. Uh, one other question: We have split buildings. Uh, we have the back, which is exactly what you've shown, but then we have a garage in front. My question is to you: Could uh, I do the garage now on my own? Start it sooner with plans and get it actually get that taken care of. And the only reason, as an owner, just that. The only reason as an owner, we're going to have to borrow some money. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So you have multiple buildings yeah. within the I'll section. Show you. I'll show you. You can take a look at these plans. This is just one of three that I've talked to contractors. You see what I'm talking about in the front there? And I'm going to want to have to maybe do the back side right away. So what you're saying is that, that garage, that garage in front. 
You're saying that you have one building. I have two buildings. Building. Two buildings. Those are two separate buildings. You have two separate buildings, but each building has, uh, I'll call it, multiple lines that need to be in the back. And, and a garage in front. And you want to you want to, to do the garage before you start any of that. And you want to face the red. Right. Yeah. I, I would re I would defer to the city as to how much facing you can do. Can you? Um, so I'm sure that Tim and his team uh, will because it's not about it's not about the engineering or the construction. You can certainly do that, but it's more about making sure that you're within the limitations of the timeline. And that that is a that is something that the city needs to provide guidance on. Right, and also also once I get the final permit to actually start doing construction, that permit how long is that permit good for? Is it good for a year? Is it good for 180 days? What? It's good. It's good for a year. Once it's issued, you have a year to start the construction and finish it. And then in be, in between your your last inspections, it's six months from your last inspection. So in other words, it's, five, it's about 180 days. Uh, so the permit, I mean, if you keep on going with construction, then it can keep, it keeps going. Oh, okay, I see. So in other words, it's just, it's just one. So it's six, uh, six months without an inspection, then it will start coming off okay. full void. There are options for extensions. Okay. Uh, extension processes to extend it. Thank you. This information is very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I live in a 400 um, family unit complex, and so I, and they're all the same, Charlie Hill complex, and so they're all pretty much the same. So I would assume all owners, all 400 plus families, would have received this notice. Would the homeowners association have also received this notice? Because I'm trying to understand how a 400 unit complex. Um, with you know some units sharing walls and but mm -hmm. you know all of that like how does that? I can work? probably take this one. Um, so in general, every owner owns their own unit. Yes. But the HOA maintains the common area. Yes. But the HOA itself is not an owner. And, and if you go into the, into the county records, there is no entry for the HOA for the board for the man for the management company. So our notices went out to us based on the county records of, of property ownership. So every one of your neighbors got that notice. But we expect you guys to work with your HOA, with your board, with your property management company to phase and organize the, the right. work. So I was wondering if you, because somebody has to bring it to their attention if they didn't get it. So that's know, something I'm, that, that's pretty really important that multiple calls from okay. multiple owners. Because I would think that everybody's going to hire pretty much the same, or, you know. No, what will actually happen is the board will bring in either a contractor or an engineer, and they'll have a special assessment to cover the costs. Okay, that was, that was my question. It's, it's, it's one structure, one building, even though it has multiple owners. To this point, you know, you have to address it as a building, mm -hmm. and how the, gets split, the color cost is split between owners. The association is going to. The association has not said anything. And so that's what we were not, we haven't been notified that they know yet. So I was just wondering how that works. You, perhaps you can talk afterwards with the city just to make sure that they actually have sent the notice to that particular building. It may be that the, that particular building hasn't sent, received the notice. So then you can, you can check with them. So the association will not be getting a notice, only the homeowners. It's up to the homeowners to contact the HOA. Exactly, because the HOA is not a, a property right. or in any property. So out of 400 families, I'm sure somebody's contacted them. I'm sure many have. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. we keep talking about our numbers, yes. And Terry yeah. specifically may possibly have already done some seismic retrofit work that had reached out to us and, and we're working through some issues of working through some review with them. And expect uh, a higher level of review, but there is some evidence that some retrofit work was done about 20 years ago. Oh, okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. So I don't stretch 20 years. Thank you. There's a lot of questions, so I don't know how you want to manage this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this uh, is a screening report. Is that a. Can that be done in terms of? A group of people like condo owners in um, particular buildings 
or you can you have to do it individually. Sure. The screening report itself, can, I would, I'm thinking is going to come from from an HOA perspective from the HOA. Um, the screening report is geared towards each building, um, so the HOA can have multiple buildings. Um, if it's a large complex, um, there most likely be like a site plan that's going to be involved that will help uh, attach your screening reports to. Um, and just to break it down so we can categorize that. Um, with the larger HOAs, some of the buildings may not need retrofit just due to their uh, the way they're structured and built. Some may not have, they might be richer without um, tucked under parking. Um, uh, as part of the as part of the complex and owners of an association for the HOA, everyone in in the on the parcel they were all notified, um, but not all the buildings of all HOAs may be considered a soft story. Like, um, for instance, we have some in Heather Village, um, in particular, uh, but that's that's part of the screening report and will help get the engineer and to screen each specific building. Uh, at a high level with pictures document it we're screening it we'll review it and then we're adjust the um or adjust our records as needed once the screen report comes and, um, we have some questions uh, from some of the attendees online so i'm just gonna um unmute this gentleman james vitali i'm sorry if i mispronounced your last name um you can go ahead and okay. On the top. Yeah. There you go. Uh, James? Yes. Um, can you hear me, Lisa? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much. My name is James Vitale. I'm the board president for the Camelot Condo Owners Association here in Fox Hills. Um, I definitely share some of the questions and concerns of Heather Village. So I'll try to offer two specific questions. Um, one is to the city of Culver City, just regarding the coordination of communication to larger HOAs and condo complexes. As you're aware, the city of Culver City, based on the county assessor's records, basically just sent, using our property as an example, uh, approximately 153 separate notices to the owners here at the Camelot. As you can understand, we're now receiving quite a bit of questions and communication from all these owners, particularly regarding the time frame for the initial inspection report. And I have mixed feelings about the, the benefits of notifying all 153 individual owners, because ultimately it's the association as the, we're essentially the legal representative of the property and the custodians of the common area. And ultimately we have the responsibility and the authority under our CCNRs to coordinate the steps that are being required to comply with the retrofit program. So I, I do just want to encourage the city of Culver City to kind of reflect on going forward, whether the most efficient form of communication with large complexes like ours is better suited to go through the association itself. And if there's a management company involved, it's management company because sending all those notices to 153 folks, most of whom aren't on the board and don't regularly attend monthly meetings, it does create a lot of confusion and concern. And now we've got 153 folks here who are all wondering, like, do we have to do something specific? Do we have to fill out a report? Do we have to find an engineer? Um, and, he, and I would imagine, too, that Culver City Building and Safety doesn't want 153 folks at our building calling them all individually because that's a lot of extra phone calls and emails for your office to filter through that would otherwise be avoidable. So I, I just want to offer that hopefully as constructive feedback to uh, Culver City as as the kind of coordinators of this. The, the separate question I have to the consulting firm, I did look at your report in quite a bit of detail. And as you confirmed earlier in tonight's meeting, your primary methodology was visual inspections and using Google Earth and Google Maps. I have strong reservations about whether the Camelot itself even meets their true requirements for a soft story retrofit. And I would like to know, again, are we going to be required to go through the time and cost of doing this 
this retrofit report, this initial inspection report, only so as to, in, hopefully, in my mind, hopefully, to dequalify ourselves as a soft story building. And that seems like a rather substantial hoop for us to go through or similar properties like Heather Village, because for condos built in the Fox Hills neighborhood, it's going to be very unlikely. We know for a fact that there are no blueprints available for our property. They don't exist. That graphic design firm was in Santa Monica. It went out of business over 40 years ago. There are no digital records. There are no paper records. We have a site plan at best. That's all we have. And the expense of trying to reverse engineer blueprints or engineering schematics for a property of our size would be extraordinary. So I'm just wondering, you know, what level of detail or specificity you're hoping to get in these schematics, because it would be a huge financial burden if we have to spend tens of thousands of dollars or more trying to come up with detailed engineering schematics just to disprove that we're not really a soft story retrofit building. And that's, those are my questions and feedback. Thank you for allowing me to address these topics. Uh, thanks for the feedback, James. Um, yeah, we will we definitely reflect on um, potential of HOAs versus owners. And uh, specifically on that screening report, there, there are definitely two different um, levels of analysis that would be done. The screening report versus like a detailed engineering um, analysis for like construction drawings uh, are two, two different levels. Uh, the level of detail um, by, for the screening report uh, is a really a rough general floor plan and a site plan, and that way you will be able to elevate it with pictures to show uh, uh, show the, the values what the elevation is, and that way the engineer can verify if it is a soft story based on looking at. Uh, the boat levels and uh, comparing the uh, stiffness and strength of those elevations. Um, so it's a tool to assist the engineer in making their determination. Uh, at that point, there is actually a higher level analysis uh, that could be done um, to where you could, an engineer could sharpen their pencil and provide a high level design to um, show by calculation that it's not a soft story. Um, but that would be a more of an extensive um, uh, type analysis. Uh, usually the prescriptive people type analysis would suffice for uh, most buildings. Um, the, the next the next more uh, layer of detail when you need to have a little more information based on framing and, and members out in out, uh, the actual building uh, members, that would be for structural uh, calculations part of the design analysis of the vector fit solution. Uh, we can take this lady's uh, question here and then we're going to go to one more question online. Uh, yeah, so West Hollywood has a screening report talk just queue, and I would recommend just whoever is doing your plans to have them do that to kind of all the process, unless you're like not on the list, that you're trying to get them on the screening report. <laughs> but my actual question is, how long is the plan check taking to be assigned right now? Sure, the, the plan check process is about uh, four weeks for submittal. And um, that would be for a submittal type. So if an average submittal was, um, say, uh, three submittals, that would be approximately three months with the city. And uh, then there would be some design side with your the consultants. So, uh, a retrofit solution could be between four and six months in, in plan check. Um, some of the, uh, there's some design uh, build firms out there that have really, or and designers that, have, that now that this is becoming more prevalent, have the analysis um, really fine tuned, and it doesn't always need that third round um, because of the, it's uh, maybe a lot of these. Okay, uh, uh, so we have Justin Max has a question. He's on the top. You can unmute him. Okay. Justin, you're unmuted. Did you guys? Oh, you left. Maybe he'll call back in. Is there another question? Um, like Doris has her hand up. Doris, do you have a question? Or? 
So maybe Justin's back. Yeah, I'm can you all hear me? Oh, there. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, first of all, James, thank you very much. And, and thanks to everyone involved. Um, and this might have been already addressed or answered, so I apologize. But I guess it just touches upon James's note as well. I'm an owner of a unit in Terra Hill. I own the below bottom unit. There's obviously a unit above us and there's many units with separate owners on this particular building amongst a bunch of buildings and units in Terra Hill. My question is whose responsibility is this? Is it as the owner, my responsibility to do all these reports, to pay all this money, or is it going to be the HOA's responsibility? And then we are dealing with our HOA because I guess what happens if, you know, we have various owners in a building, we disagree on the um, inspector that we want to use, we disagree on um, the reporting, the schematics, whatever it might be, who is then going to be able to decide how we go about making sure all of our units are in compliance? Uh, Justin, you want to go ahead? I think with that, that would be part of the HOA board uh, and based on uh, how the CCMRs are written specifically for each, for the, you know, each condo and or townhouse, and they might have some guidance in there on how you know, each organization is structured uh, and would uh, be responsible um, for those uh, improvements. Um, like Doris uh, has that hand up. Is that you, Hi, Doris. Fox Hills. Uh, and I'm curious as to why now we have this sort of compliance that we need to fulfill. First of all, our building was built in 1969. Somebody had authorized and permitted the building to be built. Um, California is not new to earthquakes. As a matter of fact, we had a large one in 1906. So who permitted our building to be built and now we have to retrofit? It seems to me to be an oversight of the permitting department. So the, uh, Yes, we live we live in, in seismic country in the Republic, right? And, <laughs> and we we have uh, had earthquakes for a long, long time. But unfortunately it's not an exact science. Engineering itself is not an exact science. And we learn every time we have an earthquake, we learn how buildings behave. And sometimes we think that buildings are gonna behave really well and we get an earthquake and it exposes a deficiency that we previously did not understand. And this has happened over and over in our history. Even though uh, prior in the old days, there was a building department and that your building may have, may have gone through the process of actually being uh, a val uh, sorry, designed, engineered, and permitted, the codes at the time may not have, may, we're not addressing, addressing this particular concern um, that has been exposed to us after the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake, the Northridge earthquake, and many more earthquakes that have happened afterwards. I mean, uh, even even in more recent earthquakes in other parts of the world, we keep seeing this. Uh, I, I particularly have seen it in, uh, in, in, in Mexico City when they had the earthquake. So the, cur the code itself, uh, does not go back and say uh, you must retrofit a building that requires an ordinance when they when the city jurisdiction uh, determines that there is a, a high risk of a particular uh, a particular deficiency then the city uh, then can consider issuing an ordinance so they can tackle that particular problem because the, the, the community feels that that is a, a high risk to the community, to life safety. And that is what happened here. 
Uh, the process was a very long process to get us to this point where uh, there was a lot of evaluations, a lot of community outreach, and, and a lot of uh, meetings with city council uh, to finally determine that this was the right thing to do for, for the community. It seems like uh, somebody made a mistake in allowing all these houses to be built and apartments and condominiums when it was quite evident that California is an earthquake state. And now we're all having to pay for somebody's oversight. And it's not like engineering is new to California. I mean, we have, look at the Golden State Bridge. That's quite a feat of engineering. So for suddenly all of us have to retrofit is just, it just doesn't seem right. It's quite expensive to every homeowner. Plus, we also have earthquake insurance to also have to contend with. It's just a lot of expenses at one time. And I think five years is very short if we have to do it. But to me, it seems like it's an oversight and we have to pay for it. Right. Uh, thank you for that information, Doris. Uh, looks like we have one more question in our audience. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Clinton Goldsmith, uh, from the city of Elizabeth. Uh, I'm trying to understand your assessment criteria that you guys use to Google Earth driving around. Did you take into consideration any structures that are recently constructed? Because one of my properties was. Uh, priority three, but we had signs that we had major remodel done in 2012. So, based on that, now I don't think I'm the only person who has a property that was recently constructed. Did you take any criteria, that criteria, and look at your, your building plans, your building permits, and say, oh, okay, this was built recently, or was this just a blanket uh, sort of an issue? Yeah, we, we did cross-reference the inventory list with our building records and try to screen as many of those off of our initial inventory as possible. If, the, if it is the case, um, that could be part of your screening report and you could add the permit and the history and just submit that as a, as a submittal to us and we'll just review the whole the permit and um, see, if it, see if it's what it in fact. And that wouldn't require a structure engineer or anything like that. So we could send that to you without having to go through that expense, correct? Yeah, you could send the permit that uh, gives the permit information as far as the evidence uh, and plans you have the plans, and that could be the start for a, a review. And then it could potentially be elevated to the need for an engineer, depending on what was on the plan, and, and or not. Thank you. I have several questions. Okay. okay. Um, is I'm not familiar with the uh, uh, rent control ordinance. My question is, um, what portion of these various things that I've written down uh, are borne out by uh, are, uh, by the tenant or the landlord? For example, loss of use of storage car storage, pet enclosures, um, loss of use of the laundry. Now, how much of it is, since there is an actual cost involved, does the uh, tenant or the landlord, um, how much, who, who pays for these things? That's my first question. My second question is, is, uh, uh, as part of this process, is insulation required for the ceiling and the walls? My next question is, uh, uh, does the city, county, or state have uh, uh, financial incentives or some kind of a grant program? Because it hasn't been mentioned uh, whatsoever. My next question is, uh, what is the penalty for missing uh, the deadline? Let's say the landlord just simply 
he ignores whatever the city uh, deadline is. What is what is the um, penalty? My next question is, what if the tenant refuses to cooperate with the uh, construction or the landlord or anything? Uh, what is the, is the uh, uh, is there some kind of action that the city could take against the tenant or the landlord? Uh, the forty thousand dollar figure uh, that was mentioned here—that's the forty thousand per the, 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 between columns. In other words, a, typically a double one. Uh, those are numbers of those are really ancient numbers. Since we have a contractor, I don't know if the contractor is here or not. Uh, forty thousand dollars seems incredibly unrealistic. Is there a better number that somebody could provide? Uh, another question is, if the building for, let's say, the, the landlord uh, manages to get rid of all his tenants for whatever reason, because is he still required under the, the ordinance to uh, uh, retrofit? My next question is, <laughs> this is a very expensive burden on the landlord. Uh, is there any estimate of how many uh, uh, housing units will be lost because of this ordinance? So, uh, okay, well, I'll start answering some of them. Or go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll work with two, two couple parts. I'll take care of the ones I know, and then afterwards, I'll, I'll send it over to our housing group so they can have, handle some of those uh, great questions. Um, the first question that I had was, you know, opening up ceiling insulation. Uh, that's not that wouldn't be required uh, if you're going to open up an entire entire wall, for something, and all of a sudden you see there's no insulation in there. You would need to add insulation. Yeah. Looking at some of our examples that we had from our retrofit solutions, most of those are from the outside. You're going to remove the stucco, put collectors on the top uh, on the at the top of that bottom bottom of the second floor, add a frame. So that would not trigger any insulation in the existing wall, existing floor, or the existing room. Um, another one I think you had financial incentives. Uh, that's always, uh, you know, a question, uh, a good question to bring up. And um, at the state level, there has been some movements over the years to get uh, a granting at the state level. Recently, there's SB 189 that was approved and funded, but then became unfunded after a budget revision. Um, so. There is movement at the state level to try to have grant funding at the, at the state level to provide for the for the for Californians. Can you, um, can you put that in the in your? Uh, no, can you notify building owners through your website or some other method that when these funding when these funds are available. I think the, yeah. the uh, building owners would surely love to know. Yes, definitely. Yeah, if, if any qualifications come up first, if it's done at the state level, we would add add it to our website and do community outreach so everyone's informed of the opportunity. Terrific. Um, the second is we're looking uh, monitoring uh, a couple of FEMA grants as well. Um, there's the FEMA has kind of two grants that's a um, kind of help apply to the situation. One is the brick grant, uh, which is a periodic grant, and then there's a hazard mitigation grant, which is um, after more of a natural disaster. So um, it's for that second one, which uh, usually are the larger one, we would kind of piggyback on that. Unfortunately, it would be another disaster, but they would open that up, and a percentage of that grant is then open up for not not that exact not ten percent is allocated to projects which would 
be able to uh, competitively go after. And um, so once those, if that happens and those become available, then we'll be exploring applying for those opportunities. And, and if those are granted to us, then we would provide public outreach and update our website and provide public outreach to our owners. Okay, in the, for example, the uh, individual home, well, not homeowner, a building owner can't apply for a grant. I assume that the city would apply for the grant and then it would be passed on through or some kind of communication between the uh, homeowner, I mean, the building owner that has no idea what's going on. And the state, I'll say the state, like you or FEMA, sure. you know, somehow there has to be some kind of really good communication because that's a really, because these numbers are really high and it's, uh, there would be a real, it would make a big difference Hello. between compliance and non-compliance as far as, uh, uh, a building owner's uh, concern. Yeah, typically the typically the city applies for the grant through the state, and then the city develops a program to then uh, give some of those funds to the owners. Uh, but as Tim uh, mentioned, those grants from the state are only open every so often, and currently there's not a grant application for this particular situation. That's true, but we're talking about is going to, this whole good. program is going to be yes. well in excess of five years. And during that period of time, this uh, may show up or may show up after, after the next earthquake. They didn't do anything for Los Angeles. You know, they've been doing this for a bunch That's of right. years now, but the state never came and helped anybody, did they? Not Los Angeles. Yeah. So why would they hear? But <laughs> uh, some cities Games. have uh, received some grants when they do open the applications. Uh, city of West Hollywood received some small amount of money to provide it to the to the tenants, but again, these these types of grants are still being developed. But, but for LA, the city was able to pass half of the cost to the owners and the tenants. Yeah, that's a pass through question that I think Tim is going to refer back to other professionals that are. Should we get that's that's a, a type of case. There's yeah. pass through and then there's tenants. Yeah. Okay. No, no. There, I'll let um, our housing group uh, address that. I think it was on one of the slides, but there, we can add that to this list. And I'll, I'll refer back and go to the next one that I can help with the penalties. Yeah. So the penalties are one of your, one of your questions. Uh, you know, it's a it's a municipal code. It's been adopted by the city council, and uh, so we would enforce it with uh, any. Um, non-compliance with the city code, uh, which could potentially, potentially be through different uh, ways that we would get to it. Uh, I can answer one of them. Simply, I have to give a permit every year uh, rent. And the city could just say, you can't rent anymore. That's an easy thing to that right there. So I can answer that one right there for you. Okay, so that that's, could be one. The one in our ordinance is a little different. You know, the one that word is just uh, refers back to our general requirements uh, for a violation of the city ordinance, which it could be, uh, the, you know, a misdemeanor and or punishable by um, by some jail time if that was the case. Uh, no, I think it, it the home trial. Um, and so that's enforcement. Also, on that road to there, there would be a recording on the county assessor that the is it, it is a it is part of the program and is not is in violation of the program. So that would be the first step would be a recordation. Uh, but before that would happen, we would communicate that uh, with the owners that they are on this list and uh, you know that this is coming down the line. Your your very first thing was uh, uh, the one major objective is to protect life, but if the building is Vacant. Does the uh, does it make sense for a landlord to uh, retrofit a vacant building? Uh, the ordinance would it still require that the vacant building is falls under the ordinance. Um, and 
I guess, from an enforcement perspective, you know, that could have be, um, you know, we're, we're not able to enforce uh, a non-occupied building, right? So we're not going to be monitoring your, your your place every every day to make sure that no one's there. So uh, that's probably what, that could be one of the reasons, but it would still fall under the ordinance. They could and I think the rest, I will uh, open it up to housing. Uh, there was still a question on the red pass through um, and Okay, thank you. So I'm going to address um, the items related to either rent control or tenant protections. I'll start with rent control because that's specifically for a capital improvement pass through. So the property would have to be subject to rent control for you to even apply for a capital improvement pass through. But we do allow for those applications. Um, so it is possible that if we find that it is an eligible capital improvement, that 50% of the cost could be. Can I just be more clear? This is important. Candace, do you mind starting over? We're having a little, be a little louder. Oh, sure. So I was going to start with uh, the capital improvement pass through. That is an allowable provision in the rent control ordinance that only applies to rent control properties. So condos, townhomes, single family homes, that would not apply to. But if the property is rent controlled, they can complete a capital improvement pass through application. And if it is an eligible capital improvement, they would be able to pass through 50% of the fee, but that we would do an entire evaluation of it. Um, and a decision would be issued based on that. Uh, the other items that were brought up are related to the tenant protections ordinance. Um, one was reduction, I mean, I'm sorry. One is tenant protections, which is if the tenant can refuse to cooperate, what happens? So the tenant only has to agree to construction if it's done inside of their unit. Generally speaking, seismic retrofit is not done in the interior of the unit and the tenant doesn't have to agree to construction on the exterior of the property. So that's not really, they can't say no um, if you're working on the outside of the property. Um, for reduction in services, uh, there's two things here. It's twofold. So one is a temporary loss, such as if there's a temporary loss of storage or parking or laundry while construction is taking place. Yes, that does have to be mitigated. <clears throat> the owner would be responsible for that. That doesn't matter if the property is rent controlled or not. If it's a permanent loss, that has to be permanently mitigated at the owner's expense. Like if the tenant is permanently losing, you know, storage that they had or laundry that they had, garage, parking space, um, they can fill out a tenant petition for noncompliance um, and we would review that and a determination would be made. Were there any other questions as it relates to either rent control or tenant protections? Is there a cap on the monthly increase for capital improvement? So it can't be more than 3% after we've determined what's eligible. What, what are the factors as far as eligibility? Because I'm looking at this page here because I printed it up and it's quite a bit of stuff that we have to fill out. The only thing I would even possibly turn in would be essentially the bill that I get from the uh, contractor and you know have my other information as far as the rents. That's all I would even proceed to uh, go after, but yet on this uh, File. I mean, they want more information. I think the bank would even ask for is insurance, property taxes, everything. I just don't understand. If I'm just trying to get, and I was under, I don't know exactly the ordinance because I thought we could only charge thirty nine dollars a month for maybe ten years. I heard something like that. Maybe I'm not up on the ordinance, but essentially, all I would be asking for me and my wife as owners was essentially a certain amount a month 
and we would, and that's for the tenant that's still living there. If somebody moves out, I don't think there is a pass through for them simply because now you can change it probably because of the rent. So I'm just, I think, I think a lot of the owners, as I represented, I know uh, four apartment buildings on the Culver Boulevard because I was part of the representative for the residents on the Culver Boulevard project. And they all came to me and they said, what is all this at? Because they, you know, they went to bathrooms. And I said, well, I'm not sure about it either, but I think the owners, all they're really looking for is some kind of help. I don't think we're going to try and say, hey, we're going to pass the total thing down to the to the tenant. And I think when this was drawn up back in when it was, I think the city council was a little pro-tenant, which is fine. I have no problem with that. But I just don't think the owners were ever really considered. And I remember back then when all this was going on as far as rent control, the owners were really never contracted uh, contacted by the city. There was a meeting over at the uh, Legion Hall where there was a, a lot of owners who were in that room. There's probably about 80 or 90 of them. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit there and say that there aren't bad landlords, because there are. I'm not going to sit there and, and justify every landlord. But on the other hand, they're talking about affordable uh, units for people. And I'll put up, it's my, our rents are common knowledge, because all you got to do is pop it up. Because we turn in the thing, and I just think you're chasing away a lot of old time owners. Our building's been there since 1964. It was through my wife's family, and now it's just her and me. So we've been there almost 50 some years. And I think what's happening, I know a lot of owners are saying, hey, depending on when interest rates, we got two or three years to make a decision and sell because we get contacted all the time to essentially sell our place. And I know what's going to happen to it because I've seen it happen to before. They're going to knock it down and they're going to get away and say, okay, fine. Let's put in some low income housing. They'll put up 10 units. They'll put two low income housing. And then the rents will be three to 5,000. I just, this city has done this now because I grew up in Santa Monica. I know what happened in Santa Monica. You cannot call the city ever since they got rent control. And I'm not against rent control. I'm really not because they needed protection. I understand that. But when rent control was passed, Culver City, there was only one other place that hired average rents, I mean, lower rents in Culver City, and all the other places have rent control. I just think the tenants are, are being sold a bill of goods because when you get with rent control now, I know every owner's doing the same thing. They're raising the rents every year. We never raised rents unless we had something like this to do or some, some major construction. So I just think the city, and I'm not talking about the people in this room where you there. I think the city council and the, and, and the public's got to realize where they're going down on this road because I grew up in Santa Monica and I'm almost 70 years old. I know where Culver City's going right now because I saw what happened in Santa Monica. So, you know, I was a tenant all my life until I married my wife, so I, I represent the tenant side in, in our business. But I just, you know, I'm kind of getting off the subject, but when I looked at this and I talked to a couple of the owners, they say, God, what do we got to fill all this stuff out? And all we're asking for is, I thought we were only going to get like $39 a month for 10 years, you know, and that's if a tenant stays there. If they don't stay there, then you change the rent. And I'm sorry to up all your time, but, you know, I, you know, I just wanted to get my opinion on it. That's all. Well, that's what the... That's what no, I'm just this for, this for. No, I know. Um, and we have about we have a few more minutes. So, if there's any other questions, are you guys going to plan to have some sort of resource fair for property owners to find like engineers and contractors like the other cities have done? Uh, it's currently it's not on like agenda is. I think as an owner, I would like to know, and not you guys promoting anybody, because you've obviously had some people already go through some retrofit in the city. I think every owner is looking for some. They don't want to all of a sudden go out and hire somebody, and then all of a sudden you guys show up and say, well, wait a minute, you got to do this and you got to do that. You know, we probably like a somewhat of a lifted would be kind of easy on owners 
not to say you're promoting anybody, but a list of the contractors and engineers that have been, you've already had things done in this city with less problem. Because I remember doing a heater way back when, and it, we, I finally, this was a long time ago, but I finally had to call the supervisor out, and, you know, a building, and it's just, we're looking for something easy at this point for us. That's all, you know, as, the own, as owners, I know that. I don't know if you can do that, or I can find out from somebody else, maybe a city council person, so you're not giving away, you know, promoting something. But I think a list of essentially engineers and contractors who've already done work in the city of Culver City that have been, had their product finished. That way, you could have a website where you can say, hey, boy, boom. You know, I think that would be helpful for owners because they're all looking to find out what's going on. You know, I've dealt with three contractors already with three different prices, you know, and it just varies from very to whatever. And I just want to make sure, like I showed you that schematic tonight, I just want to make sure when you come out, I don't have to do something else. You know, that's, and I think that's what most owners are looking for. A safe place to say, okay, it's going to cost us a lot of money, but we don't want to have to spend more money than we have. Right. Thank you. I, 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 you know, I thank you guys for this tonight. I'm kind of surprised that there weren't more owners here. You know, they want to complain and this and that, and yet they're not here, which kind of disappointing to me because I've been in some of those rooms with some of the owners, and then to me, I'm a little disappointed. And then they, then they didn't even do virtual. So, you know, apathy's uh, on our side too. <laughs> what can I say? And I thank you guys for being here. I don't see any more shows of hands, so uh, with that, we right on time, it looks like. It's 7.30, we're going to conclude our session. Uh, there is any further check questions, you can always reach us the building on the building safety department, um, retrofit.org, and uh, we can direct your, uh, we can give your answer to your question and we'll send the uh, additional department to get you the right response. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.